hands? Can someone make some noise? Are there young people in this house right now? Oh, come on, people are awake. <laughs> Great. So I think young people are really, truly taking action and showing example on this topic of future generations. Maureen, you led a survey for young people where you were asking them, what are you willing to give up to build that future? Could you share some insights of what young people have shared and how they're building that better future too? Thank you, Ines. Before going there, um, thank you very much for being with us today. And thank you to Francisco for this amazing speech just before us. Um, I'm the CEO of Youth Talks. So Youth Talks is today the largest youth consultation ever. What I want to do when I will leave that stage and when you will leave that session, I want you to want to go on the website to explore the results of this amazing consultation. Because we had 45,000 young people coming from 212 countries and territories sharing with us one million ideas. Yes, you heard well, one million ideas. Why? Because we asked them open-ended questions. So we did not impose a mindset on them. We did not impose our mindset. We made sure that they can express freely and talk about what matters for them. So yes, we had like very striking results, and one of them was the tension between regions or countries, but maybe the most striking one was when we asked these young people um, to reach out the future that you wish for, and they, they had to think to that kind of questions before because the consultation was 11 questions long, so they, they had to think a lot what they wish for themselves, for the world, what they are willing to give up, what they are not willing to give up, and why. And one of the last question was, what do you need to learn at school to reach out to this future that you wish for? And they answered something that we did not expect at all. And if we had to put boxes after that questions, imposing that mindset, we wouldn't put that box. All of them worldwide, all of them answered, can we please, please relearn how to live together? Can we please relearn how to have more respect, solidarity, empathy, open-mindedness, you name it? That was the top first priority. Meaning what? Meaning that these young people probably realize something that we don't. They realize that with the technology, with the climate change issues, etc., etc., what we need first is to act as a collective, to be, again, that human collective going forward, going in the same direction. And that was striking. And I don't want to tell you more because of the time and because I want you to get to go on the website and explore the results by yourself. But the other priorities after that one were like environmental crisis. The second one was like environmental education. So first, relearn how to live together, then environmental education, then practical skills like how to cook, uh, uh, financial literacy, um, surviving skills, maybe the pandemic has to do with, with this. Um, and then yes, like teamwork skills, soft skills, and way behind you will find like management, engineering, mathematics, or even technology. So it is striking and I think that we definitely need to listen to them because they can see things that we cannot, they have that clean slate that we don't have, and it can definitely help um, to go in the right direction. Thank you, Maureen. I think you set the stage. Young people want to take action and are taking action as well, but we can't do it alone, Derek. We need governments, we need public institutions to do it with us too. So how has Wales, Wales delivered for future generations and what can the rest of the world, even outside of this room, learn from the Welsh story? Well, that's the key question, isn't it? It's not just good enough to have good legislation and have the only future generations commissioner in the world. It needs to be making a difference. And it is making a difference. My job is to be impatient about that change and to push for further and faster change. Uh, but we can point to, to success. I think one of the most important things that we see, though, is a different approach to decision making, a governance framework that thinks about the long term every day rather than just on an occasional basis. So that's really important. 
Um, but some examples of what's changed in Wales. So we've had a big change in our transport policy from two thirds of our budget being spent on roads, transport budget, sorry, not the whole budget. Now we have one third of our budget spent on roads, the rest spent on public transport and sustainable transport like cycling and walking. We have the third best recycling rates in the, con in, in the world. Um, we have a change to our curriculum, a big change to our curriculum, so that young people are prepared with eco-literacy and the skills that we need for the long term. Um, so less about subject knowledge, more about transferable skills. So these are all um, the types of changes that are happening in Wales. Our model is not a, a lift and shift kind of model. It works for Wales. Uh, it might not work in other countries. We're humble. We try to be humble about the progress that we're making. But there is a practical model that we have here in Wales, uh, not here in Wales, in Wales, um, that we can, we can share and hopefully will be of benefit to other regions and nations around the world. I'm sure it will, and it already is. But Anu, Derek and Maureen have just been sharing how they're taking action in their jobs. But I think you can take action at any age in life. We saw it with Francisco, and now you also in retirement. Um, in creating the activist grannies after leaving the workforce, you've continued to share knowledge and also to learn in the actions that you take. Why do you believe that change is based on knowledge? Well, like, like you said, I've, I've spent my career in uh, food ingredient industry and forest industry and, and research institutes for agriculture and food economy. So, so I have a lot of background on these issues. And uh, I have to say that getting all this knowledge, it actually it changed my attitude to the future. I realized what will happen if we don't act on climate now. And uh, that's why I became a climate activist. And since retiring, like, like you said, I have been training to a climate speaker in Al Gore's climate reality. And uh, I've been giving like tens and tens of climate presentations in Finland for different kind of audience under six years time. And uh, I have learned that when I discuss with the audience after the talks, I have learned that people have often a very biased understanding of climate change. People don't really understand that it will be a crisis. And that's why I have heard that people after my presentations, when I uh, tell the same things that Al Gore is telling in his speeches, all the harsh things, they come and tell to me that, okay, I have to do something. I didn't realize that it's so important. So I think it's, it's, it's very critical that all grown-ups, not necessarily, hopefully, children, but all grown-ups should understand the crisis that we are facing if we don't act on climate now. Mm. And I think... All the people in this room understand there's a crisis. Maybe it's a question of how do we go even further than that? And Anna was just talking about learning, Maureen. And that's a huge part also of your survey. We need to change the way we learn and start really creating spaces where that future can be created. So how should we transform education with future generations in mind? Yes, that's a, that's a very big question. So I will do my best. Let me share with you a couple of ideas here. Um, first of all, so Youth Talks is about hearing the voices of the young people, collect these voices and analyze them, but it's also about making sure that it has an impact, right? So we have a network of about 70 partners now, including educational institutions, and we work with them to feed this transformation of the programs. I'm not sure if, and, and yes, let, let's remember one thing that's very important, that's the reason why we mainly work with these kind of stakeholders. Today's education is the future of tomorrow, right? We, we need to make sure that the way we will educate these young people will feed this new world that we all wish for. All right, so that being said, um, that's very important. I was wondering if we have professors or teachers in high school or university here in the, in the room. Um, I'm not sure if you 
noticed that, but the young people do not listen to us anymore. It's super hard to get their attention. And it's not because we are, I mean, not all of us are bad, so maybe, maybe I am. I'm a professor also, but it's not, I don't think it's because of this. Um, the way the world works today and their exposure to social media and to all this information is very different. A couple of years ago, we used to say, yes, you have some information on the internet, but then you don't have the knowledge on the internet. And these days, you can access to a super class from the MIT or a very famous school with very famous teachers. Um, it's very easy to get access to that knowledge. So young people sometimes, they don't understand why they have to listen here to what you are saying. And I think that the value added is not here anymore. Uh, I like that, that thing saying, we need to go from um, sage on the stage to guide on the line. The teacher, the professor used to be in front of the classroom. These days, the professor needs to be in the middle of the classroom, listening to the noise they discuss with each other and that's fine. And we are here to guide them. I'm not saying here that we need to remove all the, the field like management engineering and we need to um, stop teaching them. It's, it's about supporting them in this journey. And I would like to finish maybe with this other idea saying, uh, centuries ago, we needed to learn with our hands, right? To grow vegetables and, and fruits. Um, for decades, we, we had to learn with our brains. Um, I think that in the future, especially because of all the technologies that we have, AI, generative AI, we will need to learn with the heart. This will be the added value for human beings. And if you think about one of the main results of this Youth Talks consultation, we need to relearn all these human values and virtues. This is completely connected. This is, this is what we need, right, for tomorrow. AI and technologies will do a lot of stuff, but we need to make sure that they do it the right way, that it is not harmful for the, for the other people, so that, that's what is at stake here. Mm, you're just talking about AI, and maybe I'm not the best person to ask this because Maureen was laughing earlier. I wrote my cue cards on a typewriter, so I'm like really old school. <laughs> um, but AI is a part of our reality now, and I know you're launching a survey on AI, so do you want to tell us a bit more about that? Yes, thank you very quickly. Uh, so young people in the first edition of the consultation did not talk at all about AI and technologies. This is not what came to their minds, like naturally. Uh, but, you know, we talk about this like every day in the media. So we were like, there is something wrong. We need, we need to understand how they see that, like um, how they want to live tomorrow with this technology in education, all right, but also at work uh, and also regarding the planet and the future. So we decided to launch this new initiative. It will start uh, 10 days from now on AI, asking young people how they see themselves grow and live with AI. Um, so I invite you again to follow us. I would like to take this opportunity to um, tell my colleague here, first of all, we need to work together, uh, I'm convinced. And I would be very, very curious to ask our questions to the older people and to make comparisons between what young people think about this AI and what they think. Mm -hmm. So if you are interested, we should definitely do something because this is also about uh, closing this generational gap and try to understand who we are on this extreme and work together tomorrow. It is about intergenerational conversations and intersectional conversations. So I'm glad we're having it. I can see the timer. It's coming to an end. But Anu, I do want to come to you with a question on what can we do to generate positive change? We've talked about the problem. We've talked about um, what each of us is doing. But what can you motivate people here or even watching the recording to do? Well, yes. Um, like I said, uh, giving climate presentations, I think that's the most important thing for me as an activist because I have learned that people have to know. They have to realize what's happening. And all of you can join Al Gore's training. Those trainings are a couple of years around Europe and the US and Asia. And, and you know, you can go there. You don't have to pay for it, just, just for the hotel. <laughs> and I have learned a th two, actually two important things when I have given climate presentations. First one, talk reality. Tell the harsh facts, because people have, people have to know. And then give the 
solutions, the, the rewarding solutions that we have in our hands. Mm. As, as founding member of activist grannies, we have, we have now in Finland close to 20,000 followers, activist grannies, grandpops and, and granny-minded people. And it means that by time, we have now been working for four years, by time we can educate the old people in Finland so that they really know what's happening. Uh, we are organizing seminars, we invite experts to talk to our people and have discussions. We have Facebook and Instagram groups where we can divide good, you know, changes of life, how you can live a climate-friendly life. All these ideas, these people change with each other. And of course, biodiversity and nature restoration is one very important action point for us. One example is a joint collection of money with a Finnish Natural Heritage Foundation. We use that money to buy forests and uh, protect them for, for uh, permanently. We also organize panels for, for uh, politicians. Now we, we soon have a panel for the European, uh, European Parliament uh, candidates in Finland. And we are supporting those candidates who are for the Green Deal and nature restoration. So uh, all our members can see those panels and learn more about the, the uh, people who are candidates. Remember that people can change the world by voting. Remember to vote. And one more thing I have to say. I'm not European Climate Pet CEO, I'm an ambassador. So there's a mistake there. <laughs> well, I'm Thank sure you. you could be their CEO too. But um, Derek, I know we're running out of time on seconds. I know you're hosting a Future Generations Forum in a month, and there's also the Summit of the Future in September. So what does success look like for you in the political space? And I'll we'll close with that. Uh, just very quickly then, so we're hosting a Cardiff forum ahead of the Summit of the Future at the UN in September. And the idea is to think practically about what success looks like at the UN level in terms of impact. So what are the practical ideas that um, governments around the world can, can, can commit to at the UN in September? And, um, and to build some momentum behind this summit to make sure it is a successful and impactful event. Um, and what success looks like is, I think, clear. It, it's about us thinking long term and looking around and thinking, well, because we've acted, we've avoided those problems from occurring. And because we've looked to the future, we've um, harnessed the opportunities for current and future generations. So it's always keeping an eye on those outcomes for people today and for people in the long term, and not just about the process, but the impact that we can have. Mm, fantastic. And someone who's been thinking about that for a long time is coming on stage right now. So I'm going to thank you so much for having this conversation with me. A round of applause for our speakers, please. Thank you, Ines. Thank you.